Well, hello and welcome to our DASDR Master Series webinar. My name is uh, Deborah Burton and I am your host and moderator of today's session. What I want to do though, before we really get started, I want to just launch a quick poll uh, to make sure that you can actually hear my voice clearly and that you can see my slides. Okay, the majority of you have voted. And, ah, excellent, excellent. Very good, thank you for that. So, again, my name is Deborah Burton and I am the marketing lead for the Baza DevOps Agile Skills Association. And I'm also the channel marketing manager here at Entrepreneurs. And it's my pleasure to host you today. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be joined today by Troy DeMolin, uh, who is the Vice President of Research and Development at Pink Elephant. Um, we're going to spend some time, Troy is going to spend some time talking to you about DevOps uh, principles and practices from a leadership perspective. And I know that's a very interesting topic for many of you, so I'm so pleased that Troy is here. I'm also going to spend a moment to talk to you a little bit about the DevOps Agile Skills Association and then give you an idea of some of the uh, webinars that are also happening um, later this month, actually, tomorrow. So why don't we get started? So a little bit about the DevOps Agile Skills Association. Uh, as you may know, we launched the DevOps Agile Skills Association in April of this year. And it really is an open and independent association that's looking toward um, the development of high performance IT organizations in the areas of DevOps. Um, you know, our objective is, is is setting the stage for uh, uh, the DevOps Agile Skills Association, or DASA as we call it, as a global, open global initiative to develop competencies that will benefit individuals, teams, and organizations. And that's why we feel it's really important to offer these type of thought leadership webinars that will provide practical insights and guidance uh, into the DevOps competencies. So with that, what I'd like to do is uh, just uh, take a moment to uh, uh, introduce our guest presenter. But before I do that, I actually have a couple of poll questions that both Troy and I are very interested in learning a little bit about you. So the first thing I'd like to know, uh, we would like to know, is what is your experience with DevOps? Are you a DevOps guru? Are you an Agile Scrum expert? Are you um, someone that has experience with both DevOps and Agile? Uh, do you know a bit about DevOps and that's why you're joining us today because you'd like to know a bit more? Or you have no experience with DevOps or Agile at this time? Oh great, I see the lion's share of you have voted. Okay, for you last minute people, vote really quick, quick, okay. Uh, fantastic. So let me share the results. So if we take a look at this, we don't have any gurus join us, joining us today, but 61% uh, Troy of the folks that are kind enough to be here with us today, are they know a bit about DevOps, but they're definitely interested in knowing more. And the other large group is that they have experience with both DevOps and Agile. So very pleased to welcome you here and to have you there and I, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about just these things uh, during today's webinar. Now I have one more webinar for you because I'm, uh, excuse me, one more poll for you because I'm very, also very interested in trying to understand what your interest is in DevOps. Do you have the responsibility for it in your company? Are you like the, um, the team lead uh, for DevOps? Or do you just want to understand more about how DASA DevOps can help your team? Uh, are you interested in learning more about the competence and qualification model? Or are you like I can be many times, just a bit curious to find out more? Okay, great. Everybody is voting. I love it when everybody votes. Fantastic. Let me share the results. Oh, okay, so 42% of you are interested in learning more about the DevOps competence and qualification model. We have 29% that want to understand more about how DevOps can help 
their teams. And I think that's one of the things that Troy will really be focusing on uh, today. And uh, many of you have the responsibility of DevOps in your company. So that's great. And just like myself, a few of you are a bit curious. So uh, thank you uh, for that. And thank you for participating in those polls with us. So now I'm going to go back to the presentation. And I just want to take the opportunity to uh, introduce you to Troy uh, DeMolin. If you don't know Troy, um, he is uh, one of these really um, guru expert people out there. He is a, a, the Vice President of Research and Development at Pink Elephant. And Pink Elephant is also a forerunner member of DAZA. And we are very pl privileged to have him here uh, to provide his perspective as well as as his experience uh, in the importance of DevOps leadership. So uh, Troy is a little background on him. He is a leading ITIL and IT governance authority with a solid and rich background in executive IT management consulting. Troy holds the ITIL service manager and expert certifications, as well as has extensive experience in leading IT service management programs with a regional as well as global scope. He's a frequent speaker at IT management events and is a contributor, author to multiple ITSM and Lean IT books. He's also been very uh, instrumental in the development of Lean IT with the Lean IT Association. Um, and he, uh, his publications also include ITIL, Planning to Implement IT Service Management, Service Management, and Continual Service Improvement. So, Troy, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. We are all very interested in hearing more on your topic of DevOps principles and practices, a, leaders, a leadership perspective. So I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Deborah. It's a date and pleasure to be here today, and I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Uh, many people are, you know, thinking about the question, what is DevOps and how does it apply to me? Because in many different uh, scenarios, it has different meanings. And that's part of what we're here to discuss today, is to understand this from a leadership perspective. So I'm going to switch the slide over to the agenda here. Okay, that works. I'm clicking. There we go. So we're going to start with uh, an interesting statement, the dualistic nature of IT and how we have paradoxes in the context of the goals we're trying to achieve. Um, we're going to look at the, the kind of current scenario and focus of our industry around velocity and looking at velocity in comparison to the term agility. They're not necessarily positive or negative, but at least to understand what is Agile, what is Velocity, and how do they compare, and what is the point of making the difference? And then we're going to look at the critical and diverse dimensions of DevOps. You know, DevOps is one of these words, it's definitely on the hype of the buzz curve, as they say, uh, and many people are thinking they understand it, but the reality is it's, first of all, emergent practice, so what it was, let's say, a year ago to what it now kind of entails and holistically looks at, looks at is a bit different today. I've spoken with people who kind of kind of whisper it in, in a dark room and they say, well, DevOps is just is. You can't really define it. The moment you define it, you kill it. Well, it'll kill the spirit. Well, <laughs> I'm not exactly in that camp. But I do believe it's broader than many people think about. Um, you know, there's the old metaphor of the seven blind men and the elephant, an apt uh, metaphor, of course, here. You each take a look at the elephant, the seven blind men in this metaphor. They, they're arguing on the park bench about, you know, what is this thing and called an elephant, and they all, of course, have a strong opinion one way or the other, and they, they're going to, of course, now deal with this opinion, and they all march down and find themselves an elephant, and each of them grab a different part of the elephant. One says, well, of course, I'm grabbing the leg, right? This elephant is like a tree. Another one grabs the trunk and says, no, it's a, like a snake, and another one grabs the tail, it's a whip, and one, another one grabs the, the ear, and it's, you know, kind of this tent. The reality is DevOps is kind of like that. It's it's a combination of many different things, and this session, this webinar, is to kind of give you this holistic perspective, a systemic perspective of this term DevOps. That's the goal. So let's begin with the dualistic nature of IT. A lot of what the focus of DevOps is around begins with understanding Lean, and that's why my interest in DevOps has been, of course, uh, brought to the surface, because 
much of the the principles of DevOps come from the adoption of lean thinking and lean practices within organizations. And to give you a sense of how the evolution has occurred over the last few years, this is a great side to kind of describe it. So if you were to ask me in a conversation, you know, what the business cared about, what IT was focused on five years ago, I would have said, well, we want mature practices for service management or SDLC or project management. We want to be, uh, you know, in a situation where we're offering good partnership uh, in a strategic differentiation to the business. We want to ensure that we have reliable, available, compliant, resilient services. And all of these things are well and good, but the conversation has shifted over the past couple of years. In fact, today, if you were to ask the same questions, I'm sure you'd probably hear different words. Well, we need to be nimble, we need to be fast, we need to be agile, we need to be, you know, we need to do more with less. So this whole conversation in the world of, of IT and the world we live in has changed its tone and tenure. Not that we have to let go or can let go of any of the previous words. We still have to deliver quality, which is what you can actually sum up all of those words to actually mean, but we have to do it somehow faster, right? More with less. We've all heard the scenario. Uh, the speed of demand is outpacing the speed of supply. We're not able to scale into context of business demand. All of these are now the focuses, focus comments and, and elements of our conversations. This is why Lean, Agile, and DevOps has recently risen to prominence in our culture and our industry. So Lean begins this conversation by saying that value is going to be delivered in three ways. A, I give you the quality, that's the available, reliable, uh, resilient service. But B, I want to do that by improving flow, improving the speed of continuous flow, ideally rapidly accelerating the overall value systems we exist in like service management, project management, or SDLC. So think about Lean as a way not only to look at quality, but to accelerate flow, right? to accelerate the delivery of value. So Lean, we're going to see, comes back into the conversation of DevOps big time. But where Agile kind of spun off about five, six years ago was based on the premise of small batch, better to work on small iterative work packages than large monolithic things that tie us down and our resources pull in for long periods of time. Let's work on smaller batch pieces of work. We call them sprints and we'll focus on how do we adapt and adopt our sprint method. Every time we produce value, we can then move on to the next and dynamically change direction. But the problem with the agile premise was it was, you know, first of all, um, focused, it's not really a, a standard per se, and that's not a problem, we'll come back to that. But there's lots of variants, and we'll talk about that as well. You can see a few on the picture here. The problem with Agile wasn't the, the challenge of being Agile, it was what it was focused on. And so think about the entire value system we live in today. People have conversations with customers and they plan. They then you know, hand over those plans to builders and project managers, they build. And then the challenge of that is that it has to be put into production, into the operate or run mode, until it is actually received in run, value is not delivered. The challenge with the, de with the agile premise is it accelerated the SDLC, the software development and project side of things, but it forgot to include the move to production and the run premise, causing a bottleneck right before go to production. And of course, if you've read the Phoenix Project, which is a popular book in our industry right now, there's this poor guy, Brent. Brent's a single point of success. All things flow through Brent. And so what we ended up having was this big bottleneck of work piling up because we hadn't considered the entire value stream. Now enter DevOps. It says, hey, we need to think about the entire value stream. We can't just accelerate the front end. Uh, we do need this small batch premise, that Agile, but we need to bring ops forward into design. Let's put a DevOps team together that represents the entire end and value system so that we don't have this challenge of disconnect and handoff. So bring back the missing piece into the value stream orientation, which is where Lean started the conversation, and we're going to see that Lean is a big part of this. So DevOps and Agile are really children of Lean. And they're all accelerators on something. What are they accelerating? They're accelerating everything we've always done. You can't accelerate nothing. So you're accelerating this value stream conversation of strategy, design, transition, operations. You're accelerating the SDLC project methodology. 
uh, you're accelerating something in this context, the work you currently do. So these are the accelerators on top of our practices, our value stream and activities. So it's good to understand how this all evolved and why we're going to see, um, you know, almost as if they're all connected because in essence they are. So to begin with, we'll start with principles. And uh, we're going to see this come back a couple of times. Principles are the things we believe and practices are the things we do. So the principles of DevOps uh, as published in uh, well, basically the community of DevOps right now are surrounding this acronym called COMS. And so we talk about the fact that culture is a major component. We believe that a focus on people and the collective relationship of people is more important because if we have a group that is you know, pulled together for a collective purpose, and in fact, that's the definition of a team from Catch and Botch, that we have a group of people who have a shared interest, a, sh a shared value system, and a shared sense of ownership in something they generally produce as a team, then they will have more accountability and more effectiveness in how they do that. So this DevOps team is to basically pull together a representation from the different tribes of IT into one now cohesive team with a cohesive identity. We, the team, support this service and we do it as fast as we possibly can. And they do that through change and experimentation. Automation. Uh, a great, great part of acceleration, even in the context of lean, we call it machine time, is that if we can automate certain parts of the value stream, that allows the, uh, the skills and the knowledge of the human capital and resources to basically be doing productive stuff. So what can we move to machine time? Automation through automated test and automated provisioning to production. Of course, we have lean in the conversation of how do we define quality, uh, a value in the context of you know, quality, delivery, and cost and the whole small batch and uh, feedback loops comes from this premise of let's work in small iterative versus large monolithic. Measurement, we're looking at measurement differently. In the past we've looked at measurement not only uh, more predominantly from a silo or task basis. Now we're looking at lean measures like cycle time which is the end-to-end -end of the value system delivery or lead time which in lean is the conversation of I've placed an order with you and I get it at the other end. So these measures are more specifically holistic to the entire system of value delivery coming from Lean. Uh, because we don't have this us and them mentality, right, that's Dev and that's Ops, and even in Dev I have you know, these X towers and Ops, those Y towers. I believe in the reality that uh, if we have this shared accountability and ownership, then I'm going to share my information with you because I have your best interest at heart. So this shared learning is part of this cultural premise. So this is the principles. We the people believe in these things, and they're all good. Um, so there's, a, there's a conversation on the internet right now that really it should say clams, <laughs> because lean is kind of leading the way, but comms is a nicer word, so we'll leave it with comms. So we'll continue. These are the things that DevOps believes in. Now what, is, what then can we consider the practices of DevOps, the things that make up DevOps? And this is where it come, becomes a little bit interesting, because DevOps isn't just one thing. Uh, the best word I've heard used to describe it, DevOps as a something is a mashup. Mashup simply means it's a combination of many things. So starting on the left and kind of going to the right, it's about culture, structure, and teaming. So strategies around uh, reducing handoff and building cohesive teams that collectively own. So this is the premise of a quote-unquote DevOps team. It's about lean thinking, uh, removing waste in the conversation. It's about uh, understanding how do we improve the quality and the speed of flow through the value system. It's about agile project management. That's still a major part of that. We can accelerate the front end of the value stream, um, and that's important. right? Our SDLC has to have this small batch premise. It's about theory of constraints. Those of you who know uh, Eli Goldratt's book, The Goal, it started this you know, almost 20 years ago in the manufacturing space, but it has some basic principles that any value system is basically governed in speed by its bottleneck. And to understand how to improve flow, you have to get into bottleneck management. Because if you optimize a non-constraint, a non-bottleneck in the overall system, then you're not going to get any end-to-end -end throughput increase. So understanding bottleneck governance and management, key part of DevOps. 
continuous integration and deployment is just really coming back to our roots for what it means to do good software configuration management, good version control, um, getting into the habit of daily checking in my code into the trunk and having continuously integrated code so there's always a fresh and most up-to-date version of that code for other activities around branching and continuous delivery and deployment which is a habit of how do we build those feedback loops in in the conversation of uh, the adaptive and iterative design. Of course, we're talking about some new elements here, which is the machining side of it, the automation, and that's also part of DevOps. And then we can't forget the fact that, as we talked about, we have to understand we have to have conversations around strategy, around design, around transition and move to production. So we have to understand that we have to accelerate, but accelerate what? Well, it's the accelerating of the things we've done for a living for the last, you know, two decades, three decades of our careers. So all of this is just DevOps, right? <laughs> which just is an interesting word. It's a lot. Uh, but think about those seven blind men and the elephant again, because if you're the, you know, the tooling side of the equation, you think it's all about automation. Uh, if you're in the development role, then you're thinking, well, it's all about agile and some agile variant or methodology like Scrum. Yes, and actually, it's all of these. So this is kind of the larger leadership perspective of the question of the practices of DevOps. So just to give you kind of a sense here, let's kind of dig a bit deeper. You know, the reality is, we're in this value system. There are people who have a role in every piece of the value system, people who talk to customers, people who come up with design blueprints and requirements generation, people who have to go build this stuff, people then have to kind of move it into production, and people who get to support it at the other end. All of these people, called agents in the system, right, groups could be agents, if they don't share a common purpose and set of priorities, uh, an interesting thing happens when we <laughs> all have them be agile. So let's imagine a system where there isn't a shared constancy of purpose, which is a lean principle, right? This belief in shared accountability doesn't exist across the people who do all of this work collectively, but seemingly uh, mythically in isolation. If they're all being agile in different directions, what happens to velocity? Hmm. So the concept of being agile, quick, nimble, flexible, without a common sense of direction can actually decrementally impact flow, killing velocity. So this is why it's important, you know, we move back from the agile premise of just accelerating plan build to bring back the entire value system of dev and ops together so that we're assuring that we're all going in the same direction, pulling in the same direction, if you will, on the oars. So this is a critical aspect of speed, which is shared purpose, shared accountability. Our challenge is that, <laughs> you know, one of the challenges is the governance and leadership challenge. Um, you know, we talk about enterprise IT, this concept that we have this kind of purview or governance across all of the aspects of our value system. Our challenge is that we have silo and mental models which are vertical, not horizontal. We optimize vertically by department, by team, or by segment in the life cycle, if you will, and we don't think horizontally, and let's face it, not only do we not think horizontally, sometimes we don't even like each other, right? Because we have, you know, in premise, different goals. On the left hand, I've got the development and time is money, and that's a true statement. We've got to go faster. On the right hand, I've got this resilience, this availability, this compliance, this, you know, this maturity premise. That's also true. But that's where we talk about that we can achieve quality and flow at the same time by practices around, you know, first time right, ensuring that we good, uh, we build tested autom automated testing into our practices. Because we have to find a way to deliver both. We can't just focus on flow and not the quality and control perspective. Because what happens when that happens is not nice things, right? We have no sense of shared accountability. We have no sense of shared um, value in, in the collective thing that is done. So this is another re reason that we talk about structure changes. So the DevOps team is this concept of let's pull a group together that have you know representation at different points in the IT tribe system 
and they together collectively are going to be accountable for the outcome of the total value they're creating and the changes they're making. So there's no, you know, sorry, Kim Wasabi, it's your, your problem now. The reality is it's a we versus me premise. And so you can deal with this in structure by pulling together these teams, whether they're uh, dedicated teams or they're hybrids where they relate both to a function called, you know, database administration, but also a part of a uh, DevOps team for a specific service. These are parts of the discussion around structure. Because the whole premise of DevOps is to pull the ops forward back into design. Which, by the way, if you're an ITIL person on the call today, you'll understand a service design package, which means what are all the attributes and requirements for design, is, is considered in design. We're not just focused on feature and function, but we're also focused on non-functional requirements. You know, the whole security and... Um, uh, security requirements, the architectural requirements, the supplier integration, the support model development. That all should be done as part of the non-functional aspects of sprints, not just feature focus. That's what it means to pull operational requirements earlier into the design conversation. So, you know, one of the things that we do at our conference every year that we happen in February is we do this uh, think tank. We pull together people from a different perspective and get different insights around key questions and this year's question was how do you run a multi-speed organization where this fast velocity challenge is necessary uh, and one of the challenges of course that DevOps addresses nicely is the whole premise of wouldn't it be nice to work together structurally get a better sense of collaboration so of about a hundred organizations that were surveyed at this conference this was the question asked one of many uh, and this was the response that we saw. The good news here is only 9% aren't planning to start at all, right? getting people to work together across tribes and silos. But you can see that we're just starting. Most organizations are in the, we're getting going on this. Yes, we realize it's a need, it's a need and we've got to fix this artificial divide that's really promoted by structure and how we measure structure. Uh, we, we focus vertical and not horizontal. So this is an industry issue that everyone is facing and dealing with pretty much at this point. So thinking about that lean, so lean begins the journey. You know, it begins the whole conversation in the yellow box there. I know who my customer is and what they value. I get a voice of customer analysis. I look at the way the value is delivered. I actually visualize the value stream because if I'm going to improve flow, I can't improve what I don't understand and can't see. So let me look at this overall connective tissue of the horizontal and see where bottlenecks exist, where that's the blue, I can improve flow and deal with bottleneck issues, deal with rework or the, you know, work keeps getting kicked back three steps because I always seem to be missing this one field in a form that's not completed. Um, and then I move to pull because let's make sure that what's in the system is coming from a customer perspective. And this is where Agile will focus on product backlog and customer uh, conversation around prioritization, the product manager, product owner around this product backlog. They're deciding what the, the priorities are for the sprints and the going forward practice. And we, you know, we're never going to stop. This is perfection. In that lean world, we focus on continuous flow, removing the crazy stuff called waste, improving the end-to-end -end cycle time. Smoke is focused on small batch. Work in progress, which is WIP, can't you know overburden any one resource and expect them to work twice as fast. All of this is the basis of the acceleration principles of Agile and DevOps. So think about it this way, right? In the beginning was Mama Lean. That's at the base of our pyramid. And Mama Lean asks you some questions. What does your customer really value? How do we deliver that value faster? And how do we actually reduce waste and optimize costs? Those are the three premises of value. And you know that gets into principles, like you see on the left, true north. We all have a shared constancy of purpose. Uh, we have a Kaizen mindset. We're never stopping to you know figure out how do we fix these issues and improve flow and remove waste. We go see teamwork, respect. All of these lean principles birth the Agile movement. And the Agile movement, as referenced in the Agile Manifesto, was really kind of a, uh, an IT orientation of the lean principles um, in the manifesto. And a lot of that comes from the lean thinking and the small batch premise of, of lean. 
and all of this lean premise of acceleration is now evidence at the top of the pyramid in the various variations of doing Agile in a SDLC or project management pr perspective. So Agile is a principle-based, just like Lean is a principle-based component, and you can practice being Agile uh, by choosing you know, several different variants. This is simply a small list. There's probably an, another good half a dozen more above and beyond what you see here. But Scrum is simply a variant of Agile method. Uh, there are other variants like SAFE or Kanban, which is very lean-oriented. So these things, you have to understand, this is the kind of the basis of understanding of the holistic system. So another interesting question we asked at our conference, uh, you know, this is again these 100 companies that are being surveyed here. So this year, uh, your strategic priorities, the things you're currently working on, what do you think, what are you working on right now? And I would like to note everything to the right. If I had asked this question two years ago, I can guarantee you that this pie would look very different. So everyone, you know, there's still a lot of work in service management, as you would expect at the Pink Elephant Conference, but look to the right. The thing I want to note to the right, first of all, the, the size of the green versus the red. A lot of organizations, almost all organizations, are moving to this small batch accelerated approach. Not to say that waterfall is is completely uh, you know not relevant, but waterfall does require you to have a very predictive, stable environment that doesn't change dynamically over a period of time, which of course is a very rare thing in our industry. So this whole let's work in smaller batches, smaller time frames makes more sense because of the dynamic nature of our industry. But what I want to point out is that everything on the right is relatively new. We're talking two, maybe three years maximum in a concept of adoption, not existence, of these practices. The rate of adoption on the things on the right is dramatic and is unprecedented in the adoption of various things that we've seen in the past in our industry. And if I'm, I'm planning to ask the same question in February again, and I'm going to guarantee you in my, in my view of how things are moving that everything on the right is going to be larger again. So this is moving at lightning speed, wildfire speed, those Games of Thrones enthusiasts, uh, because of just the industry pressure that we're seeing. Another thing that's changing uh, in the industry right now is like we're, I've expressed this to a couple of colleagues, it's like we're having this terminology wash <laughs> right across the industry. Uh, this is Scrum terminology, again, which is one variant of Agile, a very popular variant, but not the only variant. And the things I just want to put out there right now, not to teach you the conversation of, of what is Scrum, but all of these words now, product backlog, um, sprints, daily scrums, or day start meetings, burn down charts, Scrum masters, this whole terminology is becoming pervasive. And so one of the things that's very important for your teams to understand is that they need to understand what these terminology changes are. So we, we are still talking about many of the same things, getting customer requirements and establishing a build practice around those, moving those into production, getting feedback, user acceptance testing we used to call it. But now the reality is this language is changing. Uh, so it's important that we keep up with the language changes. And it all comes from this, this agile movement here that's part of the acceleration premise. So I mentioned that um, theory of constraints is key. Uh, this is, if you're going to accelerate pace, accelerate velocity of a value system, you have to understand where the bottlenecks are. Because uh, as I mentioned, if you accelerate a non-bottleneck, well, then you're not going to do much in the respect of improving end-to-end -end cycle or lead time. Understanding bottlenecks and what to do when they occur is part of the premise of, of improving flow. And this is, again, as I mentioned, a part of the DevOps premise as well. So, you know, simply put, you can see a bottleneck in a system pretty clearly when you see a bunch of work piling up in front of someone's inbox or a task base and stuff's not flowing faster through that. So you can deal with that bottleneck by either dynamically increasing capacity could be through systems dynamics or just adding another person to the task permanently. So, you know, 
the thing about bottlenecks, once I govern and figure out how to flow the bottleneck faster, think about what will immediately occur in your system. Another bottleneck and another bottleneck. And so this concept of bottleneck management is key. Not that there will ever not be a bottleneck. All systems will have one. But the question is, at what point does the speed of the system equal the rate of demand coming in? And now we have equilibrium. And this is the premise of theory of constraints. It's balancing demand and supply, a key principle in respect to optimizing flow. I lost my thing here, Deborah. Thank you very much. Because we have to understand that what we live in is not centers of excellence vertically oriented, silos, tribes. What we live in is a horizontal value generating system and it's only as strong as its weakest leak. So governance, you know, if you consider governance not compliance, the concept of parenting, right? I have a direction that I would like this to be, this future state that I've envisioned as good, uh, and I have a current state that I understand, and I look at the gaps and I direct their closure. That's governance. That should be end-to-end, -end, not vertically oriented. But the challenge today is many organizations don't have anything that looks like enterprise governance. They have governance by silo. They have you know, IT strategy for operations, IT strategy for development times X, and we're fragmented in the parenting and governance approach. That can't happen in a world that's focused on enterprise velocity. That means that continual improvement also has to look at it from a value system orientation, a dev and ops orientation. So CSI has to look at the entire system from the point of view of what's killing flow, where do I need to optimize work in progress so that I get optimum resource use on people, uh, where do I have to find waste elements that I can pull out of the system because it doesn't make any sense to do the crazy stuff anymore. It has to be holistic in this premise. So, not and not, of course, last but not least, well, actually not last, but <laughs> close to the end. And why I've actually put the this question near the end of the practice conversation, we're going through this kind of that fan grid, is because a lot of people think, well, DevOps is all tooling. Tooling is incredibly important because, again, we can improve machine time, which is the principle of non-human uh, resource time. We can improve both the accuracy, consistency, as well as the automation speed of something. So. Tooling is about, you know, automating practice. Now, the interesting thing about automating practice is another key thing that DevOps requires is standardizing practice. I have to agree on standardizing things like, you know, server builds. And I have to say that we have a standard small, medium, and large server, and here's the base configurations. And if we do uh, configure above and beyond, we have to agree on what those options are. I have to agree on standard environments. I have to agree on standard versioning controls for trunk management. So just remember that automation comes with another challenge, which is agreement to standardize, which is something we don't necessarily do well in a highly variant, vertically oriented culture. But key question. So we use DevOps principles of automated testing, continuous integration, and deployment to automate how we change and you know how we improve quality and cost to market. So, as you can see, uh, the vast majority are on the path of automated everything, right? We plan to start 30%, we plan, we have started 31, but a very small percentage of the folks uh, in the survey have much, made much headway, not because the tools aren't available, because you could go to half a dozen tools today and get those tools. It's, it's about the whole question of agreement on standards and standard practice, which makes, you know, which is required for the automated aspect. Please continue. Next slide. There we go. Which takes us to, you know, the premise of continuous integration, deployment, and automation. All right, so we talked about this briefly earlier that what we're really talking about is just back to back to basics. We're doing decent and uh, robust software configuration management. We're establishing version controls. We're ensuring, ensuring people have discipline and standards around how they how they store code back on their on the trunk, the code repository, and that they're always pulling fresh code, and that 
you know, we're getting to this place where we can move more and more to production on a rapid basis. So, you know, you talk about those organizations which do hundreds and sometimes thousands, apparently, of code promotes to production a day. That means that they're highly standardized. Uh, or they've built an architecture which is completely decoupled and or they can fail back very easily because of their uh, discipline around software configuration and rollback automation to previous state. So these are all disciplines, because you know, all of this requires discipline, to, to do this, this, this rapid continuous integration and deployment. You know, there's, there's also this premise of branching, uh, where we, if we do have a need to have a larger feature bill, which is a bit more, um, well, riskier and has a bit more uh, complexity in its relationship and design, we can still basically apply the principle of, of continuous integration and deployment. One of the ways we could talk about that is that there's a difference between the concept of delivery versus deployment. Remember, the, co the key goal is rapid value generation, short feedback loops, because as the product owner is able to see the thing in production, they have five more ideas about how it could actually work. So it's still possible to do short feedback loops in a non-production aspect. I can put it into a UAT environment, which is mirroring the production environment, and I could do rapid sprint iterations into that uh, and a, in a concept of a branching strategy into the continuous delivery. And then when I have a set of features ready, I can then move that as a package and deploy into the production environment. Now remember a key principle of value generation is that we basically are governed by the ability of the business to receive. Uh, so it's not just how fast we can go, it's how fast it can be absorbed. If there are things like incidents that have to be restored or there are standard changes or patch updates which are, are not impacting on feature or function to the business, of course we can standardize and make those changes on an everyday basis as long as we have the basis for doing that. When they're a bit more uh, heavy, uh, feature oriented, they're, they're focused on business requirements, we may need to package those up into a branching strategy. We do this because the voice of customer requirement, not because we have this method of doing so. So this is still meeting the standard conversations that ITIL brings to the table, where we get standard changes, which we move down the stack of risk to the point we can basically uh, pre-approve them. But some things are a little bit more complex, and they have to be looked at in a more holistic and more timely basis for strategizing their deployment. So to do all this, you know, our industry is improving in, on its automation side. So we need good tools to allow for these good practices for acceleration. So you know we have good tools to support code control and, and trunk management. Uh, we have runbook automation that allows us to do build automation and deployment automation. We have test automation, and, and that's a completely different way, of course, of architecting and, and developing applications where we can actually say, you know, a given developer's time is spent in one-third feature build and two-thirds test build so that the system itself is self-healing and self-testing. So that allows us to do first time right, move the quality issues to the left, uh, and if we can't do that through automation, through testing, uh, through excuse me, build practice, uh, some organizations do this through dual programming where they have two programmers side by side being the conscience and the eyes of the other person. Right, so we, we try to ensure that Test testing is done at, at source, not later down the pipeline in a quality control or QA group, you know, two, two thirds down the flow. We have this premise of continuous integration and automation. That's this whole uh, continuous integration to either UAT or de uh, into the excuse me delivery to uh, to the UAT or deployment to production. So this is packaging and, and runbook automation. All of these tools are existing today. We just need the practices and agreement and the structure and the processes to use them. And a key part of that, as I mentioned earlier, is standardization. So these are all good practices for accelerating and automating the accelerating aspect, which is a big part of DevOps. Again, back to automate, which, is, which those things we can standardize. 
The last part of the conversation is the ITSM um, integration. And you can argue that one way to look at the, the need of ITSM is to describe what happens when it doesn't, it's not well integrated with the build practices. So I'll kind of tell you a story, and this story builds on a, um, a premise, you know, put out in the Phoenix Project book as well. We'll talk about planned and unplanned work. For the moment, just understand that planned work is something <clears throat> that you intended to do when you came in on Monday morning. Lean would call this value-added work uh, because, you know, if asked, the customer who's paying would say, you know, that's worthy and I'm willing to pay for that if given a choice. So there's four types of value-added work. There's net new customer projects, the stuff we do because that adds value to the customer. There's foundational projects that IT must do around um, storage or network that are necessary, like the air we breathe to do the customer projects. There's changes, because by the nature of what a change is, it's either supposed to enhance or repair, so that's improve, so that's planned work. And then there's operate. There are some people who sit down and they watch screens, because that's what they do, like Homer Simpson in the nuclear factor, factory, hopefully not eating too many donuts, but he's operating, right? He's watching. So you came to work to do one of those planned pieces of work. The unplanned is what happens when something breaks and we all have to scramble, right? So let me play this through for you. In our remaining time, we're just about done. So the first thing that most organizations focus on of these three value streams, and that's what you're looking at here, is the build value stream, this application development project-oriented value stream, because that's where net new value is created. It's obviously that's where the customer would prefer you to spend most of your time. So all these projects, in the way they're classically done, you know, they basically stand up this large monolithic project, they second to themselves all the people, resources, and they're like these trains that get plugged onto their own tracks and they start moving down towards production. Now imagine now each train getting stood up and moving down to production and they all got their, their, their team on board, but they're all self-governing. They're all kind of, orchestration is only in and among itself. It's this self-contained entity. And they're all moving down this track, and I'll change my metaphor to planes. They're all flying in to this one runway called the production environment, your live data center. But they're not coordinated. You know, using the plane metaphor, each of them have their own control tower for so-called landing this initiative. But those control towers are all separate and distinct, and they don't communicate. So as you can probably see, this is not actually a good recipe for safe landing. So you know, the question that I would then ask you to consider, what is the worst day to be on the help desk or service desk? And of course, Monday pops into your mind because you came into work planning to do one of these four valuable things, but you get called the moment you get in or even before you get into work to say, uh, SOS, we've got a problem here. And you so you dive into support, which is the bottom right value stream. Not to say support is bad, but we'll come back to that. So you spend most of your Monday doing unplanned work. Um, if you're lucky, you're out by Monday afternoon, but most of us probably get Tuesday, all right, before we've cleared ourselves from the weekend's uh, changes and the impact of such. That means that you haven't been on your email for the last two days, so you've got to catch up on Wednesday. And now Thursday, if God permits, you are able to uh, finally get back to that thing called quote-unquote planned work. Now, throw in the context that you probably have five or six pieces of planned work, and now you're switching too many value streams and you're losing productivity because you have to now try to get five things moving at the same time. You're going to lose a little bit of productivity just from what's called context switching, which is another lean issue, by the way. So I ask this question over and over again where I talk to different organizations and speak to them about these issues. And I want you to think about what percentage of time does your team typically spend in something called planned work versus unplanned? I just want you to think about that. The percentage of the week spent in unplanned versus planned activity. Now, I'll tell you almost universally across all of the organizations that I've worked with, it usually comes into about 15, maximum 20%, depending on the role that you play. Now, I want you to imagine what Lean calls <laughs> non-planned work. 
which remember in a layman's conversation is something the customer would willingly pay. Unplanned work, the planned work is something or value is something that the customer would willingly pay for if given a choice. Well, I can imagine that unplanned work wouldn't be in that category, so Lean would call that waste. That means that we spend up to 80% of our day, month, week, in activity that doesn't add value. That's because we haven't built integrations into the other service management initiatives. Now, it works a little bit different in the DevOps context in that the team has never got a representative from each part of the value stream, but I'm still going to have to build competency for things like strategy, portfolio, financial management, things in design around supplier integration, architecture, security, uh, availability, capacity, disaster recovery, um, move to production coordination, and while these exist, they might be pulled on as centers of excellence, but they still have to exist. Because if they don't exist, we get the result of their non-use, which is this discussion I've just described to you. Our challenge is that we should be getting better at this, right? There should be this closed loop learning premise that, hey, 80% of our time spent in waste is probably insane, a hamster wheel of death, so let's get off. But it doesn't happen because we're not looking at it from this horizontal perspective. And your challenge is that you get this opportunity to be in all three, but where do you spend most of your time or where does your team spend most of your time? Right. This is what happens when we don't integrate um, the service management and SDLC aspects together. It's the cause and effect. The final challenge of all of this is that basically, if you know, those organizations who've so-called even implemented service management have done maybe incident problem and change, which is stuff to the far right. And the real question is, what does that do about getting rid of the sources of unplanned work, which is to the left of the red line, you know, development? And the answer to that is nothing. It just helps us get out of the way faster, run faster on the wheel. So this is the challenge when we don't integrate surface management into this dialogue. It's kind of wrapping up here, and we can get some questions. The thing is, this means that your DevOps organization needs skills, skills and knowledge. And the DASA model is very good because it's out outlined 12 areas of specific skills and knowledge that you need to think about in the context of the wheel uh, that they've put together, but also this fan of capability and practice that I've presented here. You need skill around structure and team design. You need skill in lean. You need skill in agile methodology. You need skill in theory of constraints on the automated skill around CI, CD, and automated testing and deployment. And you don't let go of your ITSM because that has to be brought in because you can't accelerate nothing. You have to accelerate something. And that's ITSM, that's SDLC, and project management, the things we've always done. So skills around this whole elephant, if you will, is a critical aspect of just delivering quality at speed. So I know it's been a bit of a fire hose, but <laughs> this is what leaders have to understand about the more systemic, holistic perspective of what is DevOps. I'll turn it back over to you, Deborah. Well, you know, thank you for that, Troy, and I, I, I think that um that is very key, right? When we look at the type of organizations that are looking to take advantage of DevOps now, they're not just smart, you know, these startup companies that can start out with these DevOps teams. These are um, established blue chip enterprise organizations that also want to take advantage of that. They have existing IT service management um, installations. They've invested greatly in the training of their people and trying to bring all that skills and knowledge together to get value is what we see that they're asking for. So thank you for that. I think it's uh, really good for our audience to kind of understand the connectivity to understand the challenges that leadership has in trying to 
make that all come together and enable their teams and their employees to take advantage of the skills they have and at the same time take advantage of those new emerging areas that we talked about in terms of lean IT and DevOps uh, and Agile. So I do have, I know we are, we, are, we, we, we have um, a little bit of time, a few minutes left, uh, but I do have a question for you and I'm asking the audience as well if you have uh, some questions to please just put them in chat and I will be able to address them for you. But Troy, can you describe some ways in which DevOps is actually different than Agile? Yes. So think back to that early slide, Deborah, where I showed kind of the evolution from Mama Lean to Agile to DevOps. So mm -hmm. Agile, it was great in the premise of acceleration, but it largely focused on the plan build uh, side, the, the pre-production side. And it did improve speed of iteration, speed of, of development of, of work on the design. But because it didn't have the whole end-to-end -end value system in mind, it actually caused a downstream impact to and increase the bottleneck of go-to-production. So it actually decrementally impacted the total value system delivery by not including or considering the run side of the equation. So DevOps, a key part of its structure and culture is to fix that disparity and now build DevOps teams and, and consider the flow of value pulling operation requirements forward into design to make sure that they you know, repair that deficiency of not considering the total value system. Okay, well, well thank you for that. And I, another interesting question has come up. Uh, can you explain how DevOps relates to uh, best practices like ITIL, TOGAF, COBAT? So yeah, that was the, the conversation we were having just a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Remember, you have to accelerate something, right? Mm -hmm. It changes a little bit in the sense that you, you know, the way th the processes work are not in their sense, in their own senses, isolated from the DevOps practices. Uh, in the in the past, what we've had is a center of excellence, and you've had a person who's kind of been inserted into a conversation at the right time at the right place in the respect for the design build uh, move to production. Today, in the DevOps world, what we would have would be a person on the DevOps team, which is a permanent or a hybrid structure, would be pulling from and bringing to the table that part of the expertise that exists within the organization. So they represent within the DevOps team uh, the practice that still has to exist and you know still has to be a center of excellence, but they're not sliding in and out of the team. They're there as a permanent team or they're, you know, they're bringing to the table that component of the conversation, whether it's a design, a strategy, or a move to production requirement. Okay, thank you for it. I, I have a question from David, and he says, many organizations struggle to integrate project management with ITSM. Do you think they may succeed using DevOps, and why? Yeah, so one of the, the interesting perceptions um, that's incorrect for most organizations is they think that project management is somehow parallel to ITS, not parallel, excuse me, sequential. Then on the front end you have project management and then it plugs in downstream to ITSM. What I like you to think about is something along the line of the, the previous slide that they all run in parallel. In fact, think of it like this. I have this visual that I like to draw for people. Think of a value system and suck structure it and on the front end you have what they call, call the storefront. And so there's front end engagement processes. There's BRM at strategic level. Um, there's you know, the catalog at the tactical level, and then there's the service desk at the operational. Think of those as kind of three doors of coming in demand. And then all of these demand channels, strategic, tactical, and operational, feed up through requests and then into portfolio on decisioning for what the portfolio needs to be today and needs to be tomorrow and investment prioritization. That kicks off a factory process, which is now parallel, and it begins to run, like now think of this in the middle. Uh, on the build side of it, whether it's iterative or monolithic, that's your choice, but this build piece is moving along. And now think of the other ITIL process sitting on top of that build, like at the conveyor belt, and it's feeding into the project the non-functional requirements for design, you know, disaster recovery, strategic supplier integration, support model development. 
and I need you to think about you know that these these non-functional processes or idle processes are feeding into the project which are you know flowing below it at the right moment at the right time the various pieces of it and then it comes out on the right hand side now I move to production and I'm you know delivering this value and I might now need to support it and send the trucks out to repair it when it and it breaks but I like to look at ITIL not in the circle but in this kind of horizontal perspective where the build side of SDLC or project management is smack in the middle right there's stuff on the front end which is ITSM stuff that over uh, that basically is over on top of the SDLC and stuff on the other side which is support so think of it like a wrapper and I and the build piece is right in the middle okay so I have another question for you that's from Kelly she says I work for a software company that uses agile development I am the support readiness team lead working on trying to help the software be more supportable to our customers I've been trying to discuss DevOps with R&D folks but they see it as IT I think the same concepts apply do you agree oh totally uh, there's a movement out there to talk about biz DevOps <laughs> right this is where agile gets into the you know the product owner perspective the DevOps team needs to include the business perspective uh, because they are in essence part of the, the front-end requirements design perspective See, the reality is there's no true separation between uh, a business outcome and its automation they're one and the same the IT has become so dependent for business that it's now the line and to not invite them you know the factory manager or the you know the line to a strategic discussion on business strategy and research and development would be kind of insane because you're thinking that basically that this is separate things okay uh, Philip has a question he says having ITSM implies having operations engineers with more development skills mm -hmm. so one of the key premises of, of, of automation or machine time is the move towards virtual uh, infrastructure as code, right? Server as code, databases as code, uh, uh, well, network as code, probably a better example. And so these all still exist within physical entities, but the reality is we're, we're spinning up whole environments and now containers have not even needing environments, but the reality is we replicate and uh, we, we, we create virtual objects which used to be physical. So the engineer that is moving from the physical to the virtual now needs to become a coder they have to understand how to develop scripts to to define standard specifications for the build of these virtual objects as well as their packaging and promotion now as a uh, as a total environment now most organizations are going to be in a mixed scenario right they're going to have still infrastructure physical infrastructure for some time to come and but the general move is to the virtual ob, uh, orientation of our infrastructure so that means that these traditional infrastructure people now become more code oriented in the scripting and development of the VM machine and objects okay and I just have two final questions because we are really kind of over time but they're really interesting questions that have and coming and I thank the audience for that and Navin has a question is if there are multiple projects running simultaneously on a platform how is speed measured mm -hmm. so well first each project has is self-contained of course there's still sprints that are, are separate but even in the scrum methodology we talk about scrum of scrums which means we haven't left behind this premise of project port, uh, program and portfolio which is a taxonomy of things which connect to higher initiatives and so the scrum of scrums or the program of projects still has to look at the initiatives in respect to its timeline its cycle time for delivery cycle time could be uh, one sprint but it could be a, 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 a release which contains many sprints or it could be several releases right so this is all packaging these up into smaller chunks but the end to end still has an envisionment I still have a go live premise at some point and how those things are now measured within the larger context of the program time frame is still relevant so these principles of portfolio program project haven't gone anywhere they simply just have new names now with the agile uh, terminology 
Okay, and thank you. And one last question from, from me is, in your opinion, Troy, what's the most important aspect of DevOps? Yeah, it's about the relation piece. It's that first part of comms. Uh, I have to start thinking of we the people versus me or I the team. So this premise of structure, uh, this premise of pulling together teams which have a, a belief that's common, uh, that share a, accountability for outcomes, the structural component of DevOps to me is the primary and the most important thing, and all of the other things are great. But if you don't get the structure right and the teaming right, everything else is going to fail. Right. Well, thank you for that, and I want to thank you for this presentation. I think it was highly insightful in terms of understanding how all the pieces come together and how teams be can become more effective and the type of questions that leadership needs to be asking themselves when their teams become engaged and uh, begin to do more multi-cross-functional type of activities with DevOps and Scrum and Agile and Lean. So thank you so much, Troy, for your presentation. So for the audience, I, I had a final question, and that was, "Will is this a webinar re being recorded? The answer is yes. We're going to make it also available on the DAZA website for you. Uh, if you don't know, we're having another webinar tomorrow. We call these our 30-minute deep dive webinars. It's going to be tomorrow um, morning at 4 p.m. So probably for most of you in this audience, it's going to be way too early in the morning for you. It's going to be 10 minutes of Central European time and 4 p.m. in Hong Kong time. Um, but the good news is we are recording it, and we're going to be joined by Frederick Chuckin, who is a senior consultant at Quint Wellington Redwood. And Frederick is actually going to spend some time talking about uh, the DevOps principle number four, which is the DAZA DevOps principle about, about cross-functional autonomous teams. And he's going to be talking about how product organizations with vertical, fully responsible teams, um, how they uh, they must fully have autonomous teams throughout the life cycle of the product. So he's going to spend some time talking about that and how these teams become a hotbed for personal development and growth. So don't worry if it's not in your time zone, not to worry. You'll be able to find it. Um, we'll either have it on SlideShare or we'll have a link for it on our website uh, for DASA. So I want to, again, uh, thank all of you for joining Troy and I today. Again, thank you, Troy. These are our contact details. Do feel free, free to reach out and send us a question if you have it. Uh, really appreciate you taking and investing your time to spend the last 60 plus minutes with us today. So again, Trey, thank you so much. And to the audience, I wish you a, a great rest of your day. And you'll be hearing from me because we'll be advertising soon and promoting our new Master Series programs that will be made available to you. So thanks again, everybody. Thanks, Trey. Bye for now. Welcome.